Welcome to Interparty Conflict, the podcast where we answer your questions so you can have the best tabletop gaming experience possible. My name is Gabe. And my name is Jeff. And we're going to answer your questions today. But first, I have a question for you, Jeff. Yeah. Where are you? Um, I'm in a, it's, it's kind of dark in here. <laughs> uh, it's a bit of an echo. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I'm in my basement. <laughs> oh, snap. So disclaimer for any listeners today, we, we normally we record, uh, in person. Jeff mm-hmm. comes over to my house and we record here, uh, except for episode two, which we recorded at Jeff's house. Actually. Did we? Um, we did. I don't wow. remember why, but we did. I don't reason. remember that at all. Wow, it's been a long time. <laughs> it has been three over three years. But today, due to uh, the everything that's going on, we figured <laughs> why not try recording remotely and uh, see how it works. Right. Yeah. So. Pr- we we we're we're trying to promote social distancing. You know. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, see how see how this goes. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm not concerned about uh, getting myself sick from Jeff or Jeff getting sick from me. But hey couldn't hurt let's try it out and see see how how it turns out so if the quality of this episode is a little bit different than normal i apologize um we'll see how it turns out and you know we probably won't make this the usual but sure. if we ever have to it is easier for us to record remotely if if we have to right yeah yeah well, we're definitely giving this a shot and see how it goes yeah also jeff doesn't know if i'm wearing pants or not <laughs> that's true i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i can't know and now yeah. I can't think of anything else. Yeah, I know. A while back, <laughs> I was on an episode of uh, Nerds Without Pants, which is a video game uh, video game discussion podcast. Uh huh. And they always say that they're they always like make it clear that they're not wearing pants when the, on the episode. <laughs> they didn't tell me I couldn't wear pants. Just to be safe, I wore shorts while I was recording. <laughs> just just to be safe. Right. Yeah. Fa- fa- a fair compromise. <laughs> yes. Yo, you should have worn uh, denim cutoffs. Yeah. So, Jeff, how are you doing today? Um, I'm doing all right. Uh, still, uh, work is still working. Uh, so, yeah. I, you know, still had a full day of work today. Yeah, same, same here. As of uh, this recording, it's it's my it's the end of my weekend. So, I I imagine I I haven't been told not to come into work tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, and as far as I know, they were open today and yesterday. So, I probably will be working. We'll see. We'll see what happens in the next few days and so on yeah there, yeah there's a bunch of uncertainty right now but yeah for, for now we're just kind of keep keep on keep on going yeah it's this is definitely different than anything we've ever experienced in our lifetimes this yeah. is this is crazy yep so. but you know we're trying not to dwell on it too much right now yeah so let's actually talk about it for about another 20 minutes <laughs> 20 minutes okay yeah i think we could fill 20 minutes <laughs> yeah uh yeah so so um yeah, just uh, let's try to make the podcast as good as we can, I sure. guess. Okay. Um, you want to go ahead and jump into the episode? Yeah. Okay. So, Jeff, I want you to imagine that you have started working at a barber shop. Okay. And so it's your it's your first day on the job. You're, you know, standing next to the chair with the foot pedal that raises up and down, up and down or whatever. <laughs> right. And uh, an individual comes in. <laughs> to to get a haircut and a shave. Okay. And this individual is fairly large. Luckily, you have some pretty big seats. Um, this one, he's got, he looks kind of sickly. He's got like a greenish tint to his, uh, I want to call it skin, but he, it's a little scaly as well. Okay. okay. Not to discriminate, you know, hey, he's, his, his money's as good as anybody else. And so he comes over and he sits down. He knows he has a, he has a fairly full beard. Mm. He sits down and he he, he looks down. He's, he's like 30 feet tall. He looks down at you and he says, uh, I could use a shave. No. Oh. And so, you know, you're you've been trained well. You're up to the challenge. So you take out your your clippers and you lean him back in the chair. He puts his chin up. You start shaving his beard. And then you begin I, to I, notice. Do I, do I put the like the the shaving cream with the little like the little brush thing? <laughs> Sure, sure. However, whether you're using an electric razor or uh, or or just a straight razor, it's up to you. That's yeah. theater of the mind. That's up to you. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so you you begin to notice he's got like a 
like a tattoo or something under his beard. You've heard of some people, like, if they get, like, a bad tattoo on their face or whatever, I don't know, they'll grow out their (laughs) hair so you can't see it. Sure, sure. And as you're shaving this guy's beard, you begin to notice this looks kind of like a map. Mm. And you aren't quite at the point, like, at the map starts like uh, you started up at the top and you can see where the start of the map is and you you're working your way down like just above his collarbone and so you finally you get down to the bottom and you realize where this map leads do you know where the map leads jeff where does it go it leads to the dragon's (laughs) horde today's magic item was submitted by joe s uh via email And uh, the item is the Beard of Starvation. Mm. And that is correct. The magic item is a beard. (laughs) And I I will say this is actually the second draft of this. Joe S. submitted one draft and then revised it and sent it a second time. And I think he even put it on D&D Beyond. I I didn't have I don't have a link for it. But if I can find one, I will put it in the in the show notes. Cool. So. This item can be encountered in many forms. It has been known to be found in the following ways, but may take on other forms. A scroll, once read, the beard appears on the reader's face. A potion that once sniffed or sipped has the beard crawl out of the depths and cover the user's face. Beards can hide inside of healing potions and other potions, making identification tricky. Mm. It can be found on the corpse of a person it has killed. It will lay dormant until someone comes too close. Uh-oh. And it's, uh, the notes here say, adjust the saving throws to your player's level to avoid the beard's effects. So <laughs> it has effects, which we'll get to in a second, but this is pretty pretty uh, um, plainly a cursed item. I sure, guess. yeah. So you, you encounter this unintentionally, and then it attaches itself to you against your will. The cursed beard then consumes everything that comes near the affected player's mouth. Food and drink are consumed, making starvation a real possibility. The player needs to seek help as soon as possible. Oh, jeez. If dispel magic is cast, because I know you're thinking to yourself, how do I get rid of this thing? You know, if you don't want this beard, what are you going to do about it? You've got to do something to to eat again. Uh Uh-huh. If dispel magic is cast... All items eaten fall to the ground and the beard disappears. (laughs) If remove curse is cast, the devouring ends. The beard becomes a beard of holding. (laughs) What? So it actually becomes a beneficial magic item. And then the leftover beard of holding is actually now quite a blessing. It functions as a bag of holding, but also grants advantage on sleight of hand once per day to steal from a vendor. (laughs) Once fooled, A vendor cannot be fooled by this ever again. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And then just one final note. The beard of holding is deemed extremely unfair in drinking contests. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like once you once you see a beard uh, steal something, you can't unsee it. Yeah, because you know what they say. Beard me once. Shame (laughs) on you. Beard me twice. Shame on me. Am I right? Am I right? (laughs) Okay, Gabe. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, li- I like yeah, I like the I like the drinking contest thing because yeah, that could definitely be used to cheat a <laughs> cheat at a drinking contest. Um, let me ask you a question, Jeff. Did you ever watch the cartoon? It was in the early '90s. Did you ever watch the cartoon The Tick? Um, a little bit, yeah. It's been made into there was a live action TV series with Patrick Warburton about mm-hmm. ten years ago that didn't last very long and there is now there's currently an Amazon Prime live action series that I've watched a few episodes of and it seems to have gotten a better reception I don't know if it's still in production though right I'm not too sure uh, but anyway the the tick is kind of like what's the he's kind of like an alternative superhero basically he was a it was a comic strip about this superhero that was like kind of meant to make fun of other superheroes like other superhero comic books yeah and so it was very humor based and so on and a lot of the stuff was very tongue in cheek and everything but there was an episode of the cartoon where he wakes up one day and the the tick for anybody who doesn't know who the tick is he's this gigantic blue like super strong super uh you know invulnerable very dumb 
Superman guy. He just kind of he his his way of traveling around the city is he jumps from rooftop to roof to rooftop, usually breaking the rooftops in the in the process. Right. One day he wakes up with a mustache. And then his sidekick Arthur is kind of like, dude, Tick, what's with the what's with the the mustache? And Tick doesn't know where it came from. He just woke up with a mustache one day. And then the mustache starts coming to life and like beats him up or something. It okay. like it like attacks him. And I think there's even a point where he's talking to somebody else and he's like, does your facial hair ever hurt you? And the person he's talking to is like, oh yeah, man, all the time. Like, yeah, it's, it's a real struggle having facial hair and keeping it groomed and so on. And they're not quite getting the idea. But anyway, at the end of the episode, he like finds somebody else that has a prehensile beard. And then the mustache leaves the tick and goes off with this beard person. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, that very much came to mind with this because it is, it is facial hair that is in some way, in some way has a mind of its own. Right. Just in this case, it is a, a cursed one. Whereas I guess with the tick, it was cursed too. But if, if you could get on its good side, maybe it would be a beneficial item. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think this is a hilarious item. I don't really have much else. I mean, you know, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory what it does. <laughs> right, yeah. I, it, it's definitely something that I would I would be tempted to spring on my players and mm -hmm. see what happens. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. like uh, cheat at a you know, eating contest or drinking contest, <laughs> yes. you know, that sort of thing. Uh, I Now I'm picturing it like when the cookie monster eats. Right, The food yeah. wouldn't actually be going in your mouth. It would just kind of be falling and then disappearing in the beard. Right. Right, yeah, yeah. It would it would just be you'd just be crumbling it up and it's falling away. <laughs> yeah. Nom 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 nom. <laughs> uh all right. Well uh I think I think that's all we got for uh for the beard of starvation. So thank you very much, Joe S, for that magic uh magic item. And Jeff, if anybody else wanted to be like Joe S here, if they wanted to submit magic items for the Dragon's Horde, if they had questions for us to discuss, or a a character death story for the funeral pyre. How would they get those to us? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com or join us on our interparty discord at bit.ly slash interparty discord. Yes, that's correct. And before we go any further, we have a giveaway today. As usual, we're giving away a copy of Unearth Tips and Tricks Volume 1, courtesy of Crit Academy. Uh, the Unearth Tips and Tricks book is a collection of... Stuff from the Crit Academy podcast, they've got character concepts, they've got encounter concepts, they've got magic items, they've got monster variants, they have player tips and DM tips. 25 of each of those in this book. I helped write it, and so I can tell you firsthand, it is a great product, um, and Crit Academy is helping us give this out for free, so it's a great, great product. Jeff, who is our winner this week? This week's winner is Bill G. Whoa, 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 winner. winner. Oh! Gobble, gobble. Yes, that is correct. Uh, congratulations, Bill G. You should be, be getting that in your email pretty soon. Um, and if you uh, if you can, please leave Crit Academy a review on a, on a platform like DMs Guild or whatever. It would be great to get some more um, some more eyes on the product, get some more you know more people to come in and, and check that out. Also, if you have any specific criticisms or compliments, you can send them to me. I'm still working on the next uh, Unearthed Tips and Tricks book as well, so. You know, for for whatever my part is in that, hopefully I can try to make you know try to make that one better too. Cool. So, um, Jeff, if anybody wanted to be like Bill G and win a copy of this awesome supplement, how would they get that to us? They can send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail dot com with unearthed tips and tricks in the subject line. Yes, that is correct. Uh, yeah. So once again, thank you to Crit Academy. Um, congratulations, Bill G. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have some more uh, cool winners in the future. And then I want to uh, thank all of our wonderful patrons for supporting the show. For anybody not familiar with Patreon, Patreon is an online platform where you can pledge to donate a certain amount of money to the creator of your choice. If you go to patreon.com slash interpartyconflict, you can uh, pledge something to us. We've got a few different tiers. We've got outtakes on the lowest tier. We've got a monthly bonus podcast on the, the second tier. And then on the top tier, we have a monthly Roll20 game. The last couple months we've been doing... I've been making adventures to uh, run you guys through Eberron, and it's been a lot of fun. I've I've really, really enjoyed the last couple sessions, and I'm looking forward to the future. So also, we recently added some uh, some smaller rewards to, to each of the each of the tiers. We've got some, you know, little personalized things, personalized messages and stuff. So 
Um, yeah, so we've got some cool rewards on there. If you want to help out the show and get some stuff in return, go to patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. Check out the rewards, see if anything appeals to you, and then see if you want to help out the show and uh, and help make things better. So thank you, of course, to all of our wonderful patrons who have been supporting us for the last couple of years. It's been great, and I'm um, looking forward to the next couple of years. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. And then one more thing, check out the other podcasts on the Crit Nation Fellowship. Check out Crit Academy. I mentioned them earlier. They're a great podcast where Justin, Ian, and Brandon create new and reusable content for players and DMs alike. Also check out Brute Force and Ignorance. They're an actual play podcast on the network. Um, I think they, they've changed things up a little bit recently because one of the members recently had a baby. So oh. that was Dan. Congratulations to Dan. Oh, congrats. He was, uh, uh, Dan and Jake were both on our podcast uh, uh, sometime last year. And um, yeah, it's, they're, they're a great, uh, great group of guys. Also check out the other podcast. Um, check out D&D Character Lab. They're not making episodes anymore, but Garen and Dan made characters every week and pitted them against each other to debate whose characters were better. Enough with all the admin. Let's get into some questions. All right. Our first question comes from Arcanist Winterbrand on email, and they ask, how do you interpret the various saving throws in D&D? Physical ones are easy to understand, but how do you describe a mental saving throw like intelligence or charisma? Yeah. So um, saving throws for anybody not familiar with Saving throws in D&D, I imagine there's probably some listeners out there like that. Saving throws are, um, they're a type of role that you make when playing D&D. Whenever something, I, I like to think of saving throws as being whenever something on the outs, whenever something outside of you tries to, um, tries to exert some sort of misfortune over you. Okay. Like, it's not a perfect description, but a skill check is usually when you are trying to accomplish something. You're, you are actively trying to do something. Um, whereas a saving throw is when something on the outside is trying to force something onto you. Right. So there's ability, there are uh, six ability scores, strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. And then there are saving throws for each of those. In previous editions, there were only, th- like in third edition and fourth edition, there were only three mm-hmm. of each. Fourth edition did them a little differently. But there were, there were essentially, there was reflex saving throws, which were dexterity, Fortitude saving throws, which were constitution, and then will saving throws, which were wisdom. In fourth edition, they made it so that your fortitude could be strength or constitution, your reflex was dexterity or intelligence, and then your will was either wisdom or charisma. Right. But in this one, they just made it all six. Gotcha. Um, so in the Dungeon Master's Guide, there is a kind of a direct example of what each of the six are. And then we can talk about those kind of as we go. But according to the Dungeon Master's Guide, a strength saving throw is opposing a force that would physically move or bind you. Mm -hmm. Dexterity is dodging out of harm's way. Constitution is enduring a disease, poison, or other hazard that saps vitality. Mm -hmm. Intelligence is disbelieving certain illusions and resisting mental assaults that can be refuted with logic, sharp memory, or both. Mm -hmm. Wisdom is resisting effects that charm, frighten, or otherwise assault your willpower. And charisma is withstanding effects such as possession, which would subsume your personality or hurl you to another plane of existence. Hmm. So, yeah, what they, I think what uh, Arcanus Winterbrand was asking, so like, if there is something that requires a strength check, it's very easy to describe to the player, okay, there's a giant boulder that is has landed on you, make a strength saving throw to see if you can push it aside and not get trapped. Sure. That's pretty simple to explain. Dexterity also, if a dragon breathes its breath weapon at you, can you duck behind cover to only take half damage before before it hits you? Right. You know, pretty simple. Constitution is a little bit less active. Um, you, you know, it's if it's enduring a disease or poison or whatever, it might be something your character is not actively aware of. Sure. It it could be because I think I think being turned to stone is constitution is a constitution saving throw. I could be wrong. Huh. At least in third edition it was. Um so with that, that is like, oh no, this thing is is doing something physical to my body. But if it's something like a disease, it's it's not necessarily something you would be describing to the player, like, oh, you feel this virus that's going through your body and so on. Um, so that one's a little bit less active, but it's still easy to explain. You know, you yeah. can explain to the player you're poisoned. 
Yeah. Are you str- is your body healthy enough to resist it? Right. It'd be like, uh, you know, if you're like extreme weather, you know, like dealing with like extreme cold or something like that, you might have them do a constitution saving throw. And if they fail yeah. it, they might get a level of exhaustion or something. Sure. Exactly. Um, so something like intelligence, how would you describe, I mean, of course it's probably going to depend on what the, what the actual effect is, but how would you, how would you differentiate an intelligence saving throw from something like wisdom or charisma? Yeah, there does seem to, it feels like there's some overlap there. Cause I would, um, I would imagine disbelieving certain illusions that's, that falls under intelligence in this description, but yeah. my my mind immediately thinks it should be wisdom, but I think that's more of a holdover from three point five when it was yeah. will, when it was a will save, which was your wisdom score. Right, will save to disbelieve. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. So there, yeah. So it feels like there is some weird overlap, but I guess it does make sense. Like your intelligence of like understanding that wait, no, something's off here. Sure. But I guess that also could be wisdom because it's like you're noticing that something's off. You're not. It's, you know, maybe, maybe it's like, maybe you would have to make a wisdom save and then an intelligence save or I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. Um, I I think it's probably safe to say that some of these are arbitrary. Like some of them could be intelligence, could be wisdom, could be even be charisma. It's just, they were like, well, we can't have all of them be wisdom saves because that's how it used to be. So we, you know. They they probably some of them arbitrarily just like said okay this is we'll just make this one an intelligence save we'll just make this one a charisma save sure just to kind of just to kind of balance it all out yeah there are some that I think are do need to be intelligence saves like for example the maze spell mm-hmm. it's a spell that you hit the target with magic that ta- that transports them to an extra dimensional maze and then they have to make an intelligence saving throw to escape and the idea there is. Can they work out this maze? Right. Your your actually your character's actually physically solving a maze. Yeah. Hey guys, Gabe here. Um, while editing this episode, I just realized that the maze spell does not allow an intelligence save. It lets you make an intelligence check as an action on your turn. So a little different, I think, point still stands though. So that that makes a lot of sense. I can totally understand that. But yeah, illusions is I could very easily see the argument being made that illusions are as much intuition as they are noticing discrepancies in logic. Right. Hmm. You know. Yeah, that's tough. That's, um, I mean, the illusion spells, do they, do they specifically say intelligence or wisdom in any way? Um, I believe so. (laughs) It's an investigation check. Oh my goodness. That's a, that's not even, that's not even a saving throw. Um, Oh, sorry, for, for silent images, an investigation check. Uh, let me look up Phantasmal Killer. Phantasmal. Uh, nope, Phantasmal Killer is a wisdom saving throw. Yeah, so what the... Jeez. I don't know. Hallucinary Terrain. Uh, attempt an intelligence investigation check. <laughs> That's real weird. Okay, so I in in doing research for this question, I did find out that there's like a... Somebody went and took a... Made a, a tally of all of the... Spells in the player's handbook that, uh, or at least the spells on D&D Beyond, I think. So it's more than just the player's handbook. The spells that target strength saving throws, dexterity saving throws, and so on. Um, there are 51 wisdom saving throw spells, only six intelligence saving throw spells. Hmm. Um, does it say which spells? If it does, maybe somewhere in the article. I didn't actually, I didn't read the whole article. I just looked at the, looked at the, the charts. So I don't know. And now, now I know that there are certain monster abilities that do trigger um, intelligence saves. I know that mind flayers, their I believe their stun, their uh, mind blast, is an intelligence save. Uh huh. Phantasmal force and mental prison are the only illusion spells. Are you serious? I think. Yeah. Uh, well, at least on D and D Beyond, without any subscription stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so mind flayers, their mind blast is intelligence is an intelligence saving throw. Um, yeah, apparently there's only a few, only a few spells that really are intelligence saving throws. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'm looking it up on D&D Beyond and I'm only seeing, cause they have like a filter for it and yeah. I'm only seeing like a couple illusion spells and mostly enchantment spells. Okay. 
Um, I guess I didn't think about enchantment. I, I would have assumed enchantment would be charisma or something. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like it, it, it's it's very specific enchantment spells. Feeble yeah. mind. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Well, and actually, that that brings me to so because the question is asking, um, how do you describe a mental saving throw like intelligence? Sure. I would actually describe it as this effect is making you dumb. <laughs> like uh, th- this effect is making you less intelligent. Sure. So like feeble mind, uh, a mind flayers, mind blast, even something like a, a maze spell is you're super confused. You're trapped in this maze. You have to work out this thing in your head and it's, it's hard to do because every turn it's just, it's turning you around. And you're getting confused. Mm. So if I had to describe a mental saving throw, like intelligence, that's what I would do. As I would, I would describe it as the effect is making you feel stupid. Right. Something like wisdom is, I mean, it's. I've always taken it for granted as like, oh, it's an assault on your mind. That's all wisdom needs to be. Because I started playing the game when that was the only mental ability, mental saving throw. Right. So it's kind of like the, it like clouds your mind. You're not necessarily getting stupid, like less intelligent, but your your mm-hmm. mind is getting foggy in some way, or like your your okay. eyesight's getting getting foggy, or just maybe there's like a buzzing in your ear or something like that. Sure. Like um, I, I looked up earlier, phantasmal killer is a wisdom saving throw. So that's something that like your your mind is getting foggy and and it's just being filled. You're seeing horrible things and you can't you can't point your your mind away from it. Cause fear is another wisdom saving throw. So like it's similarly, your mind is just being clouded with fear. Cloud being it's being clouded with a specific emotion. Mm. Most of the of the mental uh, saving throw effects are wisdom. You know, as we said, so it's it's a bit more of a grab bag because there are going to be a lot more effects that target it. Right. Um, I think charisma. Is kind of an interesting one. I would actually say charisma, similar to how an intelligence saving throw is, some force is making you feel stupid or is just making you stupid. A charisma, a charisma saving throw, I like to think of as you are feeling some other presence in your mind and it's taking control. Right. Yeah, because because charisma is sort of like the force of your personality. Or like the force of yeah, and so like uh, one one of the ones I've uh, looked up on the list here is the magic jar spell, okay, which is like a, it's sort of like a possession spell. It basically it removes your your soul from your body and puts it into a jar, and then I think somebody else goes into your body or something something like that. Yeah. Um, so the idea is that like you're you have to use your like your charismatic your will. It's I say I'm gonna say willpower, it's, it's which is kind of <laughs> sure. like wisdom, but it's it's more of like you are you're trying to f- like force the like force your personality, you know, like like somebody's trying to force your personality out of your body, so your sure. your personality has to fight back. Yeah, being possessed by a ghost is a charisma save. But yeah, yeah, so you're you're just sort of you're exerting your personality. In you know, in defense of a possession or something like that, you're you're trying sure. to you're you're trying to make sure nobody's taking over your mind, basically. Yeah. Um. One thing that's a little weird for a charisma save is banishment. Right. Because it's a spell that physically pushes you to a different plane. Yeah. That that is sort of an odd one. I can, like, I can see I can see how that one is a charisma in in a way. Plane shift is also, if you use plane shift on someone unwillingly, that is also, they get a charisma saving throw. Yeah. So I guess that's maybe like the universe is exerting <laughs> its will on you. Right. Yeah. So it, it really is just sort of, you got, you got to fight like, no, 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 no. This is where I belong. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, this is where I live. Stop it. <laughs> sure. Okay. If so, there's a spell Force Cage, which is um, it's a fairly high level evocation that you like create a cage of energy around someone that they can't they can't pass through. If you try to use teleportation to leave the cage, you have to make a Charisma saving throw. Huh? I, yeah, because I, I feel like that's kind of in the same line of like the banishment and the yeah, uh, like that 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 kind of class of magic where like you are. You have to put a little extra oomph behind that teleport. Yeah. 
So like, cause to forcibly teleport somebody, I imagine is a charisma saving fl- throw. I think so. Yeah. So, so it's sort of the opposite where it's like, you have to like, you, you kind of got to push your way through it a little bit harder than just casting the spell. Sure. So yeah, I, that's interesting. I'd never really thought of that, that those are uh, never really thought about which spells were charisma based saving throws. Right. Yeah. It's so just, yeah, I guess I, I would probably describe it as some force, whether it's another caster or the universe or magic in general is trying to force its personality onto you force force you out of out of your body or out of the world out of the planes right yeah it's it's it's, it's trying to yeah it's trying to it's trying to force you out of your current existence yeah yeah that's Man, that's, that's, that's i really like that so yeah like you really are just kind of like I don't know, battle of battle of wits. No, it'd be like, you know, or it's just a, just a force of, you're just a force of personality that is fighting to exist in the way that it wants to. You know, a long time ago, I always, um, I came up with, I'd come up with a method of thinking of what charisma was. And, and the way that I came down on it was that looking at some of the data in third edition and such, I, I came to the conclusion that charisma is your soul. Like, I don't know how well this fits anymore because ability scores are a bit different than they used to be. It used to be that there were some creatures that were missing a particular ability score. Ghosts, for example, had no strength score Mm. because they couldn't physically interact with anything. Undead had no constitution score because they were, they're not alive. Um, uh, An immobile, you know, uh, a non, an inanimate object, even if it was intelligent, an inanimate object didn't have a dexterity score because it couldn't move. You know, you could have an intelligent sword that could talk, but it didn't have a dexterity score because it was, I mean, I guess it didn't have a strength or constitution either, but, right. um, you know, and then there were, if something was mindless, like, okay, a mindless undead had no intelligence, but it still had a wisdom and charisma. However, um, it's charisma. If it was mindless, the charisma was always one. It was the minimum score possible. I don't think there were ever any creatures that were lacking a wisdom score or a charisma score. And if, if it were to lack one, it would lack the other. Um, but what I came down to was like, even undead have a very, very small amount of charisma. And then any other creature with a, with a personality or intelligence or whatever had charisma. And I guess now that I'm working through it, I don't know how I made the leap from here to the next part. But at some point I did, I came to the conclusion that if you have a charisma score, you have a soul and the more powerful your charisma score is, the more, the more powerful your soul is because it's able to differentiate itself from the rest of the universe, from the magic in the universe and so on. Hmm. And so the reason undead have one is they undead have like a little tiny semblance of some kind of soul in them. It's just not enough to actually be a person. And that kind of makes sense as far as like why uh, warlocks and sorcerers use charisma for their spell casting. Yeah. It's not like, oh, they can tell a joke and so they're good at spell casting. Right. No, it's it's that like with warlock specifically, like it's almost like their, you know, their patron is sort of trying to possess them in a way. Ooh. Uh, but they're with their the higher the charisma, the more they can kind of control the possession. Sure, you know from their from their patron. So their patron is giving them these powers, but is trying to influence them. You know, in in however many ways. But with a higher charisma score, they can more easily use those powers under their own control and not under the direct control of the um, of the patron. Sure, it's. It's kind of like, and this could be an interesting concept for a warlock. It's kind of like the the agreement that the, the pact that the warlock signed was basically telling the patron, "Yeah, yeah, you can use my use my body for whatever you need it for." And then when they're not looking, they're like, "Okay, cool. I'm gonna use." They put all this power in my body. I'm gonna use it for some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like your boss has like you've said, "Yeah, yeah, you can set up your business in my house, set up all your computers and stuff." And then when your boss leaves leaves the house, then you go and you're using all the computers yourself. Right. You're yeah. shooting those Eldritch blasts and so on. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna use these computers. I'm gonna I'm gonna download so many movies. Yeah. Yeah, you can you can put your hot rod in my garage. 
okay, he's gone. I'm going to take that hot rod all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And um, that's what, that's what charisma score is that. Yep. <laughs> that's is, what is, warlocks are. Is, is taking driving your boss's, the hot, the boss's car hot for, hot. for a joy ride. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So it, it, this was a, a bit harder than I was expecting. Like, I mean, it is hard to tell whether something should be an intelligence charisma saving, an intelligence saving throw or a charisma saving throw or a wisdom saving throw. If I was making like a new ability, it would definitely be hard deciding which of them it was. I would probably make it something like intelligence just so it's different. Sure. There's already yeah. so many wisdom saving throws. Yeah. But I, I honestly don't think there was any rhyme or reason as to which was, which one was made, which for most spells. Mm-hmm. Like I said, some of them, it makes sense. Most of them, it's whatever. You're right. All right. Our next question comes from Arcanist Winterbrand again on email. Yep. And they ask, any advice on how to best roleplay a Kenku? Yeah, this will probably be a quick one. But yeah. uh, um, Kenku are, for anybody who's not familiar, Kenku are a, a race of beings. I think they were in, um, were they in Xanathars or were they in? I think they're in Velos. Okay, sorry. So uh, they are a race of of creatures. They're a playable race of birds. And the thing about Kenku is that there's a lot more to them. But at one point in their past, the whole race of beings were cursed to be unable to speak. Right. And so when you play a Kenku, you don't really have a voice of your own. In the according to the book, like you can really only talk or or communicate via mimicry. So when you're playing a Kenku, you can mimic sounds and so on. Um, so, you know, for a, a lot of people, it's it's a little harder to role play Kenku because you're you're not necessarily communicating with words. You're communicating with sounds. Mm-hmm. Now, I had an idea, I think a little over a year ago. When was when was your that Halloween game that you ran Was uh, that last year? Yeah, I, w- yeah, it wasn't last year. Was the, I think it was the year before that. Okay, it was two years ago, or a year and a half ago. So um, I had an idea that at the time I feel I felt like maybe I was kind of gaming the system. Like maybe the, it wasn't really meant for this. However, in the Aberon Rising from the Last War book, there is a Kenku that does exactly this. So the way that I did it was while we were playing the game, I was playing a Kenku. Mm-hmm. Every time someone would say something in character, I would write it down or I was at the computer. So I would, I would type out everything that was said and who said it. And then whenever my character was going to communicate, I would say what they said in their voice. So it's, it's that I was, I was taking words kind of like Bumblebee in the Transformers movies. Sure. If I'm not mistaken, I'm taking audio that is already there and then, taking little bits of it and then using it to establish what I'm trying to get across. Right. So I would say something somebody else said, maybe in a different context that got across my point. Right. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. It, it was, yeah, it was a really, it was a really fun experience. Cause it like, I don't know. <laughs> Cause like you wouldn't really be thinking about it. And then suddenly Gabe would, would repeat something that you said like, you know, 30 <laughs> minutes ago and you're like, Oh my exactly. God. <laughs> um, so I thought that was really fun. Is it the best way? Eh, maybe not. You know, it I, again, I don't know 100% if it's in the spirit of what they intended. Mm-hmm. Also, it might be a lot of work to, you know, be constantly writing down what everybody says in character. Right. Yeah. You can still get across, you know, ideas and stuff by commu- by making sounds and such. I would say treat the Kenku like you would treat any, um, any nonverbal character. I've played other characters in the past that, couldn't speak. I played in a mutants and masterminds campaign a long time ago. I played a mute, um, a mute telepath. No, a mute telekinetic. So I couldn't talk, but I could like move objects and stuff. Sure. And I would have my commun- my character communicate mostly through sign language in that case because it was modern day. I figured my character would know sign language. Right. I also played a character called the shoulder, <laughs> where the the only thing that he could say was the shoulder. <laughs> And and you wanted you had to solve a murder mystery or something. Somebody was kidnapped, and I I was real. It is a it is difficult. This you don't play a character like this if you are not okay with it being a challenge. If I could have just said my character is trying to communicate to you that he thinks that this happened, that would have destroyed the entire purpose. Like that's 
that's not why I was playing the shoulder. I was playing the shoulder because it was a fun idea and I wanted the challenge of not being able to talk. Right. So in this case, I tried drawing, you know, like not writing, but like I tried drawing pictures and then trying to illustrate what I was saying through that. And it didn't work. Like nobody knew what I was trying to say. Yeah. And, you know, hey, that's on me. If you're trying to play a um, a Kenku, you know, yeah, you can you can communicate through hand gestures. You can communicate through like you can sort of say my character looks at you curiously or whatever. Don't say my character wants to know what you ate for breakfast. That's not right. That's that's not something that they would get across without words. Right. Easily. So it is hard to play a character that can't speak. Try not to trivialize that. You know, if you're doing it in a fun way, like where I was saying what people had said earlier, that's one, that's one thing. But if you are not doing that, if you are committing to just sounds, try and play that up. Maybe just try to talk less, you know, try to be the character that doesn't talk because you can't talk, you know, in a lot of movies and books and such, there's the one character they'll like, they don't really, they rarely give any sort of input. They don't Mm -hmm. really talk. They just kind of like give a thumbs up or they just go along with what everybody else does, except in the times where they go off and do their own thing. You know? Right. Try not to trivialize the challenge. Try to try to play with it. Try to see what you can do without talking. Yeah. <laughs> I just immediately started thinking of uh, Silent Bob from the Jane by Silent Bob. Sure, uh, sure. Movies. <laughs> yeah. He, he doesn't usually talk, but when he, he gives like one line a movie. Right. It's yeah. always it's, hilarious. It's, and like. I, I don't I don't know the movies super well, but the one the one reference I know is the no ticket, and that's a yep. that is a reference to I think Indiana Jones. Yep, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I believe. Yeah, so like he was sort of he was it was mimicry, you know. There's yep. also another movie called uh, Batteries Not Included. It is okay. a, it is like a late '80s movie. It is a it is like a late '80s like sci-fi feel good movie. Huh. Um. It's it's about. It's about like these people that live in an apartment building that's getting going to get tear, uh, uh, torn down. Sure. Um, but then like these aliens show up and help them out. They're like these little spaceship aliens. It's okay. It's one of my f- like childhood favorite movies. It's just <laughs> it's it's ob- not it's just it's silly. But anyway, there is a there is a character who is like an old um, he's a retired boxer and he doesn't. Okay. He's very shy and he doesn't talk to anybody, but he watches a lot of television. And so he'll. <laughs> You know, the few times that he does talk, he'll he'll like he'll recite like, you know, catch uh, like uh, he'll recite like uh, slogans from like commercials and stuff. So sure. he'll be like, you know, like uh, there's a part where they like one of the aliens gets damaged, but he helps the he helps it like uh, heal. And he goes, we bring good things to life. And that's like or are bring good things to light. Is that GE? I forget. Anyway, I don't gen- know. I've never general elect. It's the Sorry. general electric uh, slogan. Sure. So, so it's just it's just one of the many commercials that he watches on television. Okay. So I, I guess I would say if you're trying to play Kenku, um, just don't talk. Like you know, even at the table, try to speak as little as possible, even out of character. Mm-hmm. Try to have it be kind of part of your character as well as your character's character. That you just don't talk. You know, like whenever I look at you, just like shrug, give an actual, give a physical thumbs up, right. thumbs down. Uh, maybe give them, you know, make like a weird, raise an eyebrow if somebody does something weird. Mm-hmm. Try to make that part of because that that will discourage it'll discourage you from talking when you shouldn't be able to talk. You know right, what I mean? Yeah. If you make it part of your way of playing the character that like, yeah, I don't talk, I don't really talk at the table, then <laughs> that that's definitely going to make your character memorable. Right? Yeah. It's. It's tricky. It's difficult. It can be frustrating, not just for yeah. you, but for some of the other people. Maybe they might get sure. they might get frustrated. But tr- you know, again, try to turn that into in-game inter-party conflict, <laughs> and uh, you go. know, make sure that you're not you know turning it into an argument over you know, would you just talk already? No, like no, sure. it's, it's I'm playing the character. Let me let me play the character. <laughs> if the other players legit have a problem with it then figure something out next session. You know, like don't, don't, uh, don't stick to your guns, even if it's not fun. Also don't immediately break the character, you know, try to, try to make it fun 
And then if it's not if it's not fun, okay, do something about it and maybe play a different character, maybe change how you're playing the character and so on. Mm -hmm. But I I would recommend, I would would recommend try not talking yourself while at the table. See how that works. Yeah. 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 Try not talking. (laughs) (laughs) Just try it. That's Gabe's nice way of telling you to shut up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so there's a there's a YouTube channel that I that I bring up every once in a while. It's uh, uh it's an animator. Uh, his name is uh, Z Bashu, and he talks about D and D a lot. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of his little like animated stories I think he has. Uh, it's a, probably like a playlist on his channel if you look it up. I think it's the one that's called the cold the cold road, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, but there is a Kenku like antagonist like npc in in the adventure that is like okay it like that is used to really good effect because like it will use the player's voice to like antagonize them Ooh. so there, there's a moment where they're like they're they like he's like stolen something of theirs and they're trying to get it back and they find and they find him and they like kind of capture him but then he manages to like trick them into setting off a trap or something and he escapes and then they're like, well, shoot. Okay. But then they, so they end up in like a cave to fight some goblins on a quest or something. And then like the goblins are more organized than they normally are. And like the local town is like, you know, it hires them to go, you know, figure it out and they get in there and they're like in total darkness. And suddenly they hear like one of their characters voices, but off in the distance. Okay. And it's like it's because the Kenku is basically like teamed up with the goblins to like fight them or something. So it's like, yeah, it's like, you know, it's sort of like this eerie situation where you hear your own voice in a th- but like but it's threatening you, you know. OK. And it's like that. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, If you do play the Kenku that uh, that does like use people's words, um, like, you know, use actual words that people said. Um, it could be a fun opportunity to do impressions of your friends at the table. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Try not you to know, be too if, too hurtful with it. But. I guess if you think that that would go over well, I think that could also be a lot of fun. <laughs> Gabe, you know. what if it's just a Kenku that all they do is they talk like this, like burp, burp, like the, like the, like this sort of stereotypical, like in, you know, I'm making fun of you uh, imitation <laughs> sort of voice, but like, that's all they, that's all they ever sound like is like, they just, they just repeat things you say, but they, this is what you sound like, burp. <laughs> That'd be pretty good. <laughs> it's like I'm a I'm a master of mimicry. Meh, 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 meh. <laughs> I think we should go to the store. Meh, meh, meh. <laughs> and that's and they they end every line with meh, meh, meh. right exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, I think that's gonna be my next uh, Kenku character. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. <laughs> the thing about Kenku is that. I always want them to be small sized. Yeah, like I well the original artwork for them uh in I think the it was in third edition 3.5 that I think at least when I first saw them. Yeah. I forget which book they were in originally. But yeah, like the original picture like the the way that it was drawn made it seem like it was small sized and it was just sort of like the way that their stance was or They're like kind of the, like stocky. Yeah, like, which like, yeah. Looks better if they're small. Right. Yeah. If a bird is stocky, like it was like it was more wide than I thought it would be if it was going to be, yeah. you know, you figured they'd be like tall and slender and lanky with, you know, long bird legs or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I think part of the curse that removed their voice also removed their flight or something, because I know there's some to the lore of them. There is something of like they, they're yeah. always trying to get they're always trying to get their flight back or something. That did come to mind, but I wasn't sure if they had, is there any sort of like anything stopping them from using a fly spell? I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. That that probably is part of their lore too. Right. It's like the, one of the reasons why they, they tend towards like being like, uh, they're, they're never like, they're always like the assistant to a wizard or something like that. You know, <laughs> they're, they're kind of like familiars in their own way. Gotcha. So I don't, uh, yeah, they, they have an, they have an interesting, they have an interesting lore about them. Like they're, they're, yeah. they're really neat, but yeah, I always, they are. I always imagine them small size, but they're, but they're medium size. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. All right. Um, I think that'll do it for our regular questions for today, but, mm-hmm. uh, we do still have our social media questions. So the last social media question was, if you could have one D and D monster as a pet, assume that it is trained like a pet and not overly dangerous. What would you want? 
Do you recall what your answer was? My answer was an Otiug because it would g- it would it would give uh, <laughs> really good hugs and it would uh, dispose of all of my garbage. Yep, and I think it'll eat your garbage and produce hamburgers. I think we said <laughs> right. Well, I just I assumed it would it would it might create fertilizer or something yeah, that probably. I could use in like gardening or something like that. You know, just trying to be like you know, uh, you know, environmentally conscious with an Otiug. You know, sure. And I think I said, um, I said blink dog Mm -hmm. because it's a dog. It's intelligent. It's lawful good. And it can teleport. So, right. Yeah. Why not? Can it teleport you as well? Can like, can you do it? Like, I don't think it can. I think it's whatever it is carrying, but no other creatures. Yeah. Cause if you could do like a tag along teleport with your dog, that'd be awesome. Like you, you have it on a leash and because it's on a leash, you can teleport with it. We're going for a walk. Zap. I think you just need to be a blink Jeff. Blink Jeff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <it> sounds good. <laughs> All right. So we got we got a few responses on mm-hmm. uh, Facebook. Haley B says, my current character has a bone devil trapped in his bag of holding, but he can't let it out or it will almost definitely kill him. Um, He's already named it Bone Daddy. So I suppose he'd uh, like that as a friendly pet instead of an enemy. Gabe, I thought this was supposed <laughs> to be a family friendly show. <laughs> it is if you keep your mind out of the gutter. Okay, but no, no, my mind's in the gutter because I have a pet Otia game. Oh, there you go. There you go. Uh, Elliot M, there's a, a typo in here that I think is kind of funny. He said, uh, ancient golf dragon. <laughs> an ancient sure golf dragon. Ancient, ancient gold dragon would make an excellent guard dog. Save on gas and travel expenses by riding it, and it would probably make you rich when it starts instinctively creating a dragon's hoard. Now, I just have to interject here. Where do you think it's getting all of the money for its hoard from? Right. It's just taking Probably it from you. Probably taking it from you. <laughs> yeah. That actually, that, that misspelling thing makes me think of, um, is it Adventure Zone that has the thing where it's like you, you change one letter of a, yes. of a spell? I mean, they didn't invent it. It was, uh, it's, it's a, a fairly well-known magic item, but yeah. Sure. Um, but it's like a, it's a, it's like a offensive thing that changes one letter of a monster's name <laughs> okay. and it poly it's like a it's polymorph but it polymorphs them based on what letter you change that's pretty cool oh it could be like um if because if it only works on offensive things it makes them less offensive it could be holy morph <laughs> holy morph <laughs> sure sure <laughs> uh elliot goes on to say uh the dragon makes its home in idyllic locations so my yard would probably be at least pretty nice I, it can even glimpse the future somewhat, so that's got to be helpful somehow, too. And I believe they can transform into humanoid forms, so easy to take places. Mm. So there you go. It's your pet and your friend. Yeah. Um, Lisa, my wife, says, finally something nerdy that I can relate to. Although, she didn't give an answer. <laughs> she might be referring to, because I put a picture of a... It's a dog in armor with a sword that says, uh, so what's your backstory? And the dog says, my owner didn't come back from work, so I'm going to find him. Right, yeah. <laughs> She's probably referring to that. Uh, Kyle S. says, I'd love a rug of smothering, mostly because I just need a new rug. But it could also help with any would-be burglars. Sure, yep. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Eric B. says, wolf. I put a little emoji of a wolf. Aw. Uh, Eric M. says, a little goblin buddy that is hyper-sarcastic and condescending. <laughs> I mean, hey, you do you. Yeah. Uh, Ryan Peters says a Drake. So uh, a rapper. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Gabe. Over on, sorry, over on Reddit, Alistar the Minotaur says, don't know if you guys count this, but I'd want an, an awakened dog. I've always had strong bonds with canines, and I've always felt like I understand them in some unspoken way that they instinct instinctually recognize and seek me out. But to actually be able to have a real conversation with one would be awesome. Except for my dog. I love her, but by the gods, is she dumb? (laughs) An excerpt from the journal of ZZ the Pitbull. Arg, the mailman. (laughs) (laughs) Even just being able to tell your dog, don't worry, I'll be back in a little while. Or just do what I say. This is for the best. Right. Or it's be like so much better. That person walking up front is not yeah. going to hurt us. <laughs> yeah. Or please stop stepping on my feet, you 140 pound dog. <laughs> or get out of my bed. <laughs> yes. You have your own bed in the other room that is almost as big as this bed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, on, Kate, why don't uh, you sleep in that one? <laughs> 
no. Right. <laughs> Take away his ability to talk back. Uh, zero zero Jiminy Cricket says, I'm reading the legend of Drizzt at the moment. So a panther, definitely a panther. Cool. Jesus Bagels says, Pseudo Dragon, my little poisonous telepathic buddy. Oh, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, Pseudo Dragons are pretty good. And Pruno says, A homunculus would be the best pet. It is a tiny construct that doesn't require food, doesn't make poo, (laughs) doesn't bark, but can still communicate with you at great distances so it can act like a security system. It knows everything you do, so it can also help you keep track of all of your chores and will not die until you die so you won't be without your little helper. Aw. Also, this is from Gabe. Your little helper won't be without you. <laughs> Over on Twitter, that's Carl with a K, says, In the Midgard campaign setting by Kobold Press, there's a group that rides griffins. That would be a pretty awesome pet. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, anything you can, like, ride and fly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, August says, I'm in a dungeon of the Mad Mage campaign, and my character literally just bought a pet giant fire beetle at a spooky pet shop in Skullport. Truly the best in-game purchase I've ever made. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. I'm start- I'm starting to get like Hagrid vibes. <laughs> yep, definitely. No, no, it's it's a, it's a nice a nice fire beetle. It's a blast ended scoot, you know. A, <laughs> of yep, a bang ended scoot. Right. <laughs> as, as Rita Skeeter called it. Right. <laughs> um over on Discord, Jason E says, and Jason E was actually the one that came up with this question. He asked it on Discord a few weeks ago, and so I uh Made it the social media question. Uh, Jason says, my wife, Mayorgrid, said she wants a displacer beast. I want a boulette. Both good choices. Oh, my goodness. A boulette would be. (laughs) As long. Okay, here's what I would do. If I was if I had a boulette, I would ride in its mouth (laughs) so that it could burrow and I wouldn't be getting hit in the face with dirt. You just, yeah, just burrow your way to work. Make your own little system system of tunnels to go through. There you go. Uh, Autumn Wind says, a mimic, especially for an illusionist or arcane trickster. You come home from work or return to your room at the inn holding a juicy morsel. You start using your baby voice. The satchel on your bedpost starts <laughs> wagging its tail. I think a, a baby mimic is, a do- is, the concept is adorable. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that for sure. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, no, I was thinking, I was thinking mimic, uh, it, yeah, it's just like you have a, something that like, do, do mimics hold treasure? Is that a thing that they actually I mean, do? I guess they, they can. I would imagine. Well, Cause I'm thinking of mimics from like, uh, dark souls where there, there's actually an item in that chest. You yeah. just have to fight yeah. it first. <laughs> but like, if, you know, if like, it would be a way to protect your belongings, you know? Yeah. Dustin says a golden pseudo dragon. The beverage tea says owl bears are classic, but probably poop too much. I'll <laughs> choose a Rakshasa as long as it's tame. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> see, it's difficult to to justify like the ones that are like highly intelligent, but yeah, but, but we didn't specify anything anything other than so. So if you want, if we're gonna have a buddy, a Rakshasa would be good because it's very powerful. <laughs> sure. Or uh, just a uh, or like a like a djinn, like you know a genie. Yeah. Yeah, if you're trying to game the system, that's definitely the one to choose. Yeah, my best friend is a genie. I could just get wishes from him every day. Wish for all of the pets. Yes. <laughs> um, Floofy Shoob says, I'm always the DM, so my ultimate pet is, of course, the Hound of Ill Omen. And it's adorable because Floofy Shoob's avatar is an adorable dog. <laughs> so Dustin replied saying that he's picturing that dog as the Hound of Ill Omen. <laughs> um and uh Collins B said a monodrone, the cutest of the Modron family, just a metal ball with an eye. Yeah. <laughs> Little robot. So friend. Yeah. I I personally I like the idea of Modrons, but I hate how they look. They just look so yeah, they're, they're kind of goofy. I don't know. Anyway, so yeah, that was the last social media question. The next social media question that we have, and this is uh inspired by What's going on in the world right now? Uh, I hope this isn't in bad taste, but have you ever played in an RPG campaign centered around a pandemic of some sort? Mm. I mean, I can only think of, uh, uh, I think it was in the Age of Worms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where uh, uh, there was the um, the the worms that were, were making zombies, basically. It wasn't, it wasn't yeah. necessarily a pandemic. It was more and just. Not quite. Not not quite, but yeah, there, we would come across the 
uh, the like worm zombies. I forget what they were yeah. called. Spawns of Kiss. Spawn, yeah, the Spawns of Kiss. So it was like, you know, they they were just like n- like nastier zombies. Yep. That that would uh, that would show up every once in a while. Um I wrote a one of my fictions was about an event in the backstory of that campaign and so I I wrote a story about a group of soldiers that encounter a Spawn of Kiss. So yeah, um I I personally have not aside from the Age of Worms also um I think I played in a campaign where there was like tainted drugs going around that's really the closest i've come i've never actually played in a campaign that centered around something like that so right yeah um but i'm curious to see if if anybody um anybody out there has and i guess sorry it's it's it may have been unstated when i post i haven't actually posted it yet so but if you have how to go what what you know what happened right yeah so uh, all right, so those are uh, they'll do it for our questions for today. But before we close out, let's uh, let's relax, let's sit back, let's take a deep breath with our uh, medical masks on <laughs> our faces. Right. <sighs> let's remember those who have come before us, who have given their lives, so that we may have a better world to live in as we toss another log onto the funeral pyre. And today's funeral pyre story is a short one. It was submitted by Reddit user Well Dang. <laughs> and the story goes as follows: Party turned evil. I did not. Explosive consensual PvP ensued to let me make a more morally questionable character for the campaign. <laughs> and that's it. All right. <laughs> so the the rest of the group turned evil, and rather than cause interparty conflict, uh. Well, Dang chose to basically get his character killed so he could make a character that fit the rest of the group. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> hey, let's raise a glass in memory of Well, Dang, who took one for the team. Clink. Clink. All right. That'll do it for today. To submit questions for us to discuss, items for the Dragon's Horde or stories for the Funeral Pyre, please email us at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. For show notes, links to media mentioned on the show, and running lists of questions and magic items, go to interpartyconflict.com. Join the discussion on social media. Find us on Facebook. We're on Reddit. We've got uh, um, our Interparty Discord. We're on Twitter at InPartyConflict for our weekly social media questions. If you answer them, your answers might end up on the show. Check us out on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, YouTube, anywhere you download podcasts. Please rate, review, subscribe, or just tell a friend. If you'd like to support the show monetarily, check out the rewards at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. We have a few different tiers, so anything you can spare, even a dollar a month, would go towards making the show better, and you'll get bonus content for it. Jeff, tell, tell us about FriendQuest. FriendQuest is our YouTube channel where we play video games. Yes. And you guys, uh, I didn't listen to the whole thing, but you recently put up <laughs> some Stardew Valley. Yeah, yeah. We got a, I got a couple, uh, I have a couple more hours of uh, footage right, that I have to put up still, and then uh, I think um, uh, as of this recording, we, we, we probably would have recorded... Uh, Maybe some more Stardew Valley, and I think we were thinking about playing another game as well. Cool. Uh, Speaking of video games, check out my side project, the Arcade Memories Podcast. If you'd like to submit your own childhood memories of going to the arcade, send them to me at arcadememoriespodcast at gmail.com. Also, head over to bit.ly slash interpartyconflict to take a short survey about our show, what you like, what you don't like, etc. And just for taking it, you'll get two free printable board games, courtesy of Mary and Tom, over at hollandspiel.com. And our music is made by Boxcat Games from Nameless the Hackers RPG. So, Jeff, until next time, stay safe and stay healthy. There you go.